All right, I'm going to get started. If you are here for Think Locally, Build Globally, how Drupal can power a headless omnichannel web platform, you're in the right spot. If you're not here for that, feel free to stay. If you don't want to hear about that, I won't be offended if you head out. Um, yeah, I'll be looking at that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this door real quick. That's a little better. Okay. Oh, sorry, and I need to close the door on you. That's been recorded now. They're gonna have to take it out. All right. So let's jump in. Um, first of all, our agenda. We're gonna go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how of headless omnichannel web platforms. Now I know that's a lot of buzzwords. We're gonna break it down in a couple of slides, so that way you kind of get an idea of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, this talk should be probably about 30, 35 minutes. Um, so there'll be a good amount of uh, time for questions and answers at the end. Hopefully if I, you have questions, I can, uh, I can answer all of them. All right, so let's jump right in. Starting with the who. So we'll talk about who I am and then uh, who this talk is for. So if you're noticing, yes, that is the who. Um, Andy, the talk's full of them, so just keep on laughing. Excited. Keep on laughing. All right, so who am I? I'm John Picozzi, Solutions Architect at EPAM. Uh, I'm a co-organizer of the New England Drupal Camp. I am uh, an organizer of the Drupal Providence Meetup. Uh, and I'm a co-host on the Talking Drupal podcast. Um, so that's enough about me. Uh, but uh, for the past year plus, um, I've been working uh, to build a headless omni-channel web platform. So today I'm going to share some of my learnings, uh, the process that we used, and uh, hopefully help all of you on your journey uh, to a headless web platform. So. Who's this talk for? Um, well, this talk's really for anyone who uh, thinks they need or, or needs a um, headless web platform. Um, you know, if you're in the position right now where you're like, oh, we could go headless, we do have you know, quite a few sites, we do need a, a platform to support them, um, hopefully this talk helps uh, enlighten you to the, the possibilities and the benefits, or if you're on the fence, maybe it'll do the opposite and say, oh, well, we don't actually need, need all those bells and whistles. So let's get into the what. What is headless, uh, what is an omni, omni-channel, uh, that is a mouthful, right? What is a headless omni-channel web platform? And uh, what do these systems consist of? So first and foremost, is it a website? Well. This talk is actually going to have a ton of definitions in it. I like to, I like to define things, make sure everything's really well, well defined here. So uh, we dropped in a uh, definition for a website. So uh, as it reads there, a set of related web pages located under a single domain name, typically produced by a single person or organization, uh, and a single connection point to your users and customers. So you'll notice the word single is used quite a bit there, right? So. It's a, it's a connection point. Well, that, that's kind of, you're all building websites. You know that websites are a connection point, right? Um, but it's kind of like single focus, right? Single purpose. Um, users are using it to connect with your business. So the short answer is no. It's not just a website, right? So let's get into uh, some more definitions, right? So let's break it down a little bit. So first of all, headless or headless CMS, those, those words are um, sometimes uh, interchangeable. Headless more referring to, you know, uh, not, having, not having a head. And uh, headless CMS being a CMS that's providing an API, right? So um, headless software is a software uh, capable of working on a device without a graphical user interface. So um, the idea is, I don't want to over explain this because I think most, most of you know what what headless is, but like it's basically 
think of it as like your back end, right? Your front end is different or, or maybe decoupled in some cases. That's another term that's used. Um, headless content management system is uh, also called headless CMS, is a back end only web content management system that acts primarily as a content repository. I struggle with that a little bit because if you're using Drupal, um, Drupal can also be a content layout tool for you. So we'll talk a lot about that as we get into kind of the how you implement this because um, there are a couple of different ways you can go. It could just be a content repository for you, um, but in the project that we'll talk about in a little bit, we're using it actually as a layout tool with Layout Builder. So I struggle with that a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, a headless CMS makes content accessible via APIs for display um, on a number of devices in a number of ways. So the key takeaway there is it doesn't have a front end and it's uh, API uh, focused. What is omnichannel? Well, omnichannel is just a uh, high quality customer experience um, that um, basically gets to your customers via multiple channels. Those channels could be a website, they could be email, they could be uh, in-store um, uh, kiosks of some sort. Uh, the possibilities are, are really, really endless. And then a web platform. The definition of a web platform is a web 2.0 concept. Um, you know, I believe that you know, a web platform has kind of existed quietly in the background for a lot of people for many, many years before web 2.0. Um, but it goes beyond simply just something that powers your website. Right, it uh, typically can power you know multiple entry points, the omni-channel aspect of it, but also it, it can bring together um, a bunch of different systems into a centralized place for you to act upon and for you to use the data of. So, oh look at that! I didn't fast forward. You guys were so nice, not saying anything. But let's get to the answer there, right? What is it? Uh, so it's a combination of many tools um, in, in streamlining your customer experience and personalization through multiple methods and touch points, right? So like everybody here is like, oh, right. Now I get it. That, that makes complete sense, right? If it doesn't, that's OK. We're going to keep talking. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you, you get it. It makes more sense, right? All right, so let's jump into what can these systems consist of? Well, they can consist of a lot of things. Uh, they can be built based on a design system. And you know, when we get into the how, typically I think a design system is a great starting point. Um, they can be, design systems can be a common language between your design team and your development team, but also, a common language between your design team, your development team, and your content editors. So they can consist of a design system. We are at a Drupal camp. This talk would be eh, OK, if it, 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 but if it didn't include something about CMSs, but that's not, that's not what we're doing here today. So yes, a CMS can be a part of the, your web platform. Um, yes, it is Drupal, have no fear. Or it could be something else. There are many web platforms out there that are powered by other, other CMSs, but we love Drupal, so that's, that's what we're gonna focus on here today. Uh, Third-party integrations. So services like Search, um, Digital Asset Manager, you wanna make sure you're bringing those services into your web platform. And then um, a PIM or CRM system, if you have data outside of you know, the, the platform, you need ways to get that data in so that maybe you can use it for personalization or, or on-site marketing, in-app in marketing, that sort of thing. So interacting with those systems. Also, it's a two-way street. Data comes in from those systems. Data could also go out to those systems. So this is not an exhaustive list. Let me be very clear. Your web platform can consist of a number of other systems and integrations and, and things, right? The idea here is really to think of this as a starting point. All right, let's jump into the when. Uh, when does it make sense to use an omni-channel web platform? And then when doesn't it make sense? 
So there are a couple of scenarios. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. Do your due diligence for your organization or your group. Um, any folks involved in education here working for uh, EDU? Okay, perfect, awesome. So you guys in the education space, right, you have multiple schools, right? Those schools need websites. They need to be able to promote their, their classes and activities and things, right? So this is a great strategy for them. Um, we're seeing great, uh, a lot of use with this strategy for large organizations that have multiple brands, units, um, organizations or companies that have branches, uh, you know, you think of like a bank or, um, you know, a brick and mortar type, type store. Um, this solution really uh, does, um, you know, really works well for, for those, those types of organizations because they have the ability to, to customize. They have the ability to benefit from some of the things we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so the omni-channel part of this, right? If you are in need of having a central data source where it's powering multiple things, and things meaning a website, emails, um, kiosks in your store, a mobile app, right? This strategy makes a lot of sense because it doesn't really make sense to build backend systems for all of those implementations, right? So you want to make sure that like that's a, that's a factor that you're thinking thinking of. Heads up displays are another thing. Um, you know, I, I know Dries has mentioned one or two times at a DrupalCon like Tesla is using using Drupal, right? So that's another another instance where an API based approach, uh, a headless based approach makes a lot of sense. And then I think the third one here is like if you already have a design system, or you have a third party integration that your whole company needs to use, it, this could make sense for you and could be a way that um, you know you can help to direct your company's resources and save money right um, and we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about the, the money saving aspects in a little bit when we get to more of the, more of the benefits of, of this strategy um, but those are again not an exhaustive list but some things you should think about when thinking about an omni-channel headless web platform so that was who you know who this does make sense for let's talk about who it doesn't make sense for and again this you you have to you know do your own analysis do what's best for your your organization but you know a single use website for example probably doesn't need a, a whole web platform to support it like for example my personal site host on pantheon great right but I don't, I don't need a, a whole web platform. I'm not integrating with third-party services. I'm not, um, you know, uh, I don't have a design system. Trust me, if you go to it, there'll be a link later. You know, I do not have a design system. Um, so like, this is overkill for me, right? Okay, documentation site. Typically documentation sites are pretty um, uh, uh, straightforward. Um, you know, they're not uh, overly designed. You know, they made, they're made for, you know, readability. Um, usually a, a coupled solution makes sense there. Like, uh, you know, we our front end's coupled to our back end. Fine, great. So maybe it doesn't make sense, right? Um, a site that doesn't need any growth or improvement, which a lot of you might be thinking like, all sites need love, John. All sites need love. They need to be um, improved and, and they, they grow. Um, but sometimes there's just a site that's up for, you know, for one thing. It's up for like a week, two weeks, a month, and then like maybe you're taking it down. This could be, again, could be overkill. So go through the process of, of pros and cons, thinking it through before you, before you just jump into an omni-channel um, web platform. All right, let's talk about the where this approach is used today. And I'm breaking this down, in, in, again, not exhaustive. This is just, a, just an example of a couple of instances where I've seen this work. Um, one is a project that I'm working on right now. Another is um, just a regular commerce implementation. And then the last is actually a book that uh, you can check out to um, get more examples of, of places where this will work. So let's jump into that. So first and foremost, the global pharma company. A uh, large pharmaceutical company needed a web platform to support its 100 plus unique US brand websites. 
Um, by using Drupal as a content management and uh, layout tool, coupled with a component-based design system, they were able to quickly bring the sites, uh, bring sites to market, both reducing the amount of maintenance and giving each of the sites control over its look and feel. So those were kind of the key takeaways there. They wanted to give site owners the ability to customize. They were working on a design system already for their organization. And Drupal was a great, not only content repository tool, content management tool, but also allowed them through Layout Builder to be able to place different components from the design library within the system, right? So this solution has an API first approach um, and the API does offer up page layout flow and all of, all of those things, powers multiple sites and allows for multiple front end applications, right? Right now it's only being used for web front end, but that doesn't mean down the road it couldn't be used for a web app, couldn't be used for a, a in-store display if need be. Um, a uh, unified component-based design system, uh, you heard me mention that a little bit prior, um, was used, um, which provided many benefits and improvements. It kind of unified the ability, and you'll hear me throughout this talk talk about governance, right? It, it allowed the organization to really unify on the same, the same level, um, which had its own set of benefits for them, right? So everybody's kind of using the same design system, the same component base to build their websites, but yet they're building websites that are vastly visually different from one another. Um, Server-side rendering helped improve the speed here. So part of being headless is that we have Next.js, we can do server-side rendering. Um, we use the benefits there to improve page speed, um, also to help with SEO, to be able to you know, server-side render those and then serve them out to um, crawlers. And then again, Drupal and an API-based architecture um, allows for easy integration into third-party services. So through Drupal, we, you know, everybody in this room probably knows we can connect to anything, right? Um, there's a module for that. So this system was able to take, uh, take uh, use that and, and push it forward to their own third-party services. The middle example here is a commerce site. So, uh, we've all, this is a gross generalization, but we've all probably bought something online, right? Um, and, you know, commerce sites typically are, have a PIM or a product information management system in the background. Um, those systems are typically sometimes separate from what's powering their website or their mobile app. Um, a omni-channel web platform uh, is super useful in, in this scenario, right? Where you have a um, you know a PIM that you need to get information out of, maybe put information into, right? If it's managing your orders, um, you know you might have a uh, another system for fulfillment that your platform can integrate with, and um, and then as far as design goes, you know decoupling that from that backend system allows for you to do a lot of um, have a lot of power on the front end as to how things get displayed. Also. Uh, taking that data and moving it again from your website to your mobile app to maybe even an in-store, uh, you know, point of sale system if need be. Uh, I was working uh, uh, last year um, on uh, a Acquia Commerce Tools accelerator that kind of took this model and brought it into into Drupal. Um, so. There'll be a resources uh, page at the end of this, this slide deck with a QR code you can scan. There's a link to the, um, a, an article about the Commerce Tools Accelerator there. So you can read more about that. The last example is a book by uh, Gatsby, formerly Gatsby, I don't know how they're handling that, but Gatsby co-founder Sam, ba Sam Bogwat, who um, uh, wrote Modular, the web's new architecture. This book is great because I'm not a big fan of reading and it's a really short book. So let that be a, a reigning endorsement from me. It was a short book. I actually read it over the Thanksgiving holiday. So um, that to that, but uh, the information inside the book was really great at looking at kind of this um, web platform architecture 
this headless web platform architecture where you can have multiple systems powering your headless website. And uh, the reason I put it here as a, an example is because it has a bunch of great examples and use cases in it. Um, so I recommend uh, checking that out uh, as well. All right, so let's jump into why. Why is this working for those people? Why are they interested in, in building this, this system? Well, a lot of people are interested in cost savings. Folks that are implementing uh, web platforms are seeing uh, a reduction in maintenance cost. Um, also reduce development cost, which I know you might be thinking like, if you're a developer, like that's not good. Like I, I, need, I need them to keep coming to me in order to do things. Well, we'll talk about the shift that's happening, right? It's not so much, hey, we need you to maintain the, the thing that you, you originally built. It's, hey, we need you to add features to the thing that you originally built to support us into the future. Um, and then it, the last thing here is um, in cost savings, right, is better organizational spending. So something that um, I'm hoping, and we'll talk about this, I think, in more in detail in the next slide where we talk about governance, but something I'm hoping to write a, a blog post about uh, in the coming, coming weeks or months is how this approach can actually help your organization to be more thoughtful with how, they, how it spends their budgets. So cost savings is a big one. The other aspect here is testing. Testing once um, and using everywhere, right? So the beauty here is that you are building this for an omni-channel audience, right? But it all comes back to a central point. And that central point can be tested once and then used everywhere that you're, you're using those components using that, that website. Now, there may be more rigorous testing because you have to consider every eventuality, but it happens once and then website one can use it, website two can use it, website three can use it into infinity, right? So you really have uh, uh, the ability for exponential growth here. Um, with that, you can do more focused testing, right? So instead of just testing it like, oh, does it work in the browser? Okay, good. You can do, especially if you're using a design system to start, you can do user testing to make sure that like this component's really going to do what we need it to do. People are really going to click the button or view the article or do, it, do whatever the task is, right? And you are able to, these two actually kind of work together because like when you test, you test something, you test it once and that in the long run saves you money. You may be spending more money doing more additional testing, but in reality, you may not have done that testing if you were just kind of like building a website and putting it out on the web, right? Faster time to market. This is a huge one. Anybody that's like, I need a web platform. Uh, we need to build websites faster. Everybody wants things faster. I like to be like, oh, can we slow down? Can we take it easy, please? But everybody needs things faster. And a web platform like this will allow for you to get websites up faster, right? Known components, known architecture. Again, we're gonna talk about governance on the next slide and, and a couple of slides later. That's a big piece of this, but it allows people to move more quickly to their end goal, which in most cases is a website, sometimes it's a web app, but whatever, it gets them there faster. The last one's a big one. Um, and I talked about this, I think, a little bit uh, at the beginning with the cost savings, but reduce tech debt. Tech debt affects us all. Every project has it. But you can see a reduction in technical debt because people are focusing on more long-term solutions. It's not a, oh, hey, we'll just do this now, and then we'll come back and fix it later. It's a, hey, we're building a platform. The platform needs to support the community. Okay, let's think about this and what the repercussions are. So we're taking that kind of like, you know, faster time to market, good, but we are slowing down in development to say, hey, let's think this through. Make sure it makes sense for the whole platform. All right. Here it is. The NFL, that's funny. 
Um, better governance, right? So governance is an interesting, an interesting topic, and I could actually probably do a whole talk on, on web platform governance and how like your web strategy is governed. Um, but with a, uh, you know, a omni-channel headless web platform, you are kind of in control, right? People are using the platform, so you have the ability to say, okay, well, the platform does this, but it doesn't do that, right? And that's leading to better governance of your organization, right? Uh, you know, an example I was thinking of this morning was um, in education, right? Like everybody wants to do different things with their with their web platform, but there has to be a, that common layer, right? There has to be like, hey, you're all part of a, a, an organization, a university, right? So we have to keep that layer of governance, and here's what you can do, and here's what you can't do. This leads to a better a better uh, implementation of that governance because it's set once by the platform and then everybody kind of abides by it. If you're going you know, back, say, five, 10 years, when everybody's building their own web instances and everybody's doing their own thing, now you're applying that, having to apply that governance to each at one, adding extra cycles, right? Everybody's following the same rules and the same path in a, Omnichannel web platform. Reuse, right? We talked about cost savings. Reuse is a great way to reduce cost, right? You have the ability to reuse components. You can use it on site A, you can use it on site B, you can use it in your car, you can use it on your phone, right? Same component, works everywhere. Comes back to single, single build, right? Single test, testing suite, right? Reuse, for the win. You can share features. So this is something that, again, in that last scenario where universities, everybody has their own site, they're all kind of building their own set of features. And typically, organizations, you know, as much as, as, as brands or units want to be different, they need the same, the same base set of features, right? Well, here, <laughs> you have the ability to share features. Right? Mind blowing. This also reduces the need for people to spend their budget on the features that already exist. Somebody, everybody seeing the theme here? Like, you can save money. It will help you save money. It's not going to be cheap in the beginning, but it will help you save money. Um, the last but not least is the, uh, you know, shared integrations. So every organization has integrations. Everybody has another system that does another thing they need to integrate into their website somehow, right? You can streamline that process. Again, build it once, reuse it for everybody, right? So you have the ability to share those integrations if architected well, built smartly, right? All right, so how? How do we do this? We're going to solve it all right here. We're going to solve everybody's web problems right here in this room. We're not. But I'm going to give you some, some starting points, some areas where you can um, investigate on your own, uh, uh, basically some, some tips to get, get you started on your journey to a uh, headless omnichannel web platform. So let's see. First one, and we already talked about this. A design system, and there's a definition of the design system. Thank you, Wikipedia, for that. Um, I'll let you read that on your own. But um, I find that the best way to start this process is with a design system because it already has kind of that set of that set of components, that set of rules that then can be again that common language between your design team and your development team, and then hopefully uh, forward onto your content team, right? And it's a great way to come together to start the build of, of, a, uh, of a, a platform like this. Hey, there it is. Drupal, right? We're all here, Florida Drupal Camp. We all love Drupal. Maybe we're evaluating Drupal. We're new to the, new to the ecosystem. Hopefully you will learn to love Drupal. Um, when I'm talking to clients about how Drupal fits, you know, people say like, oh, Drupal, it's a content management system. Like you put your content into it and it 
comes out, right? I like to think of it more as the glue or the traffic cop that brings this whole system together, right? In, in an omnichannel web platform, Drupal can live in the middle, right? And it can, it can be the glue, it can connect third-party systems, it can, it can bring, bring your team together. It can also play traffic cop to how data gets sent and, and received from, from third-party systems. So we talked about a, a CRM earlier, right? If you're integrating with Salesforce, Drupal has a module for that, right? You can use that to ingest that information from Salesforce, use it on your front end, how you see fit, and then somebody fills out a form, bring that back into Drupal, Drupal can send it back out to Salesforce, right? Playing that traffic cop, like, come on Salesforce, okay, no, now you stop, now, okay, go, right? It can be the glue, it can bring systems together. Hey, my Salesforce integration, for some reason, doesn't talk to my product, inform uh, product information system, right? Well, I need those things to talk to each other because I want to know that, um, you know, Chris here in the front row uh, bought some coffee and that, you know, he needs to get an email to say, hey, it's time to reorder because you, you know, you, you might be running low, right? And then last but not least, you know, I think it could be used for a content layout tool. The project I'm working on right now, we are using Layout Builder. Our client goes in. They have a set of components from their design system that we've built as Drupal blocks. They can pull those blocks out, put them into a layout, do all of the styling, all of the, all the stuff they need to do in Drupal. That gets sent out via the API to the front end, our React front end, builds it out, says, hey, I know that component. Here's the order they need to be in. Okay, put it on the page. Here it goes. Right? Great layout tool. So, Drupal, for the win, recommend it. You wanna be API driven, you wanna be API first, right? That's, that brings the headless piece into this, right? Um, you wanna make sure you're thinking about your APIs and how they're, what information is stored in Drupal and how that gets put out to the front end. I had a conversation with uh, my developer team lead the other day and I was like, oh, this logic can just live in our React components. And he said, yeah, it could, but let's think about like if this isn't on, on the web or if this is this component, you know, if this information, right, is needed somewhere else in some other application, right? Now it's, now it's out in the React component, we can't get to it. So I was like, yeah, you know what? You're right, that makes a lot of sense. We need to bring this back into the CMS so that way it can go out through the API and can be used by everybody. So you gotta, you gotta change your mindset a little bit if you're not used to thinking this way and thinking like, okay, what, what does the component need to do and what does the API need to provide to it to be successful? And maybe right now it's, hey, we're just doing it for the web. But you also have to think when you're starting to build a platform like this, about future use, right? You're always future-proofing. So, API first, always think that way. All right, so here it is, governance model. And again, as I said, you know, we can, another definition brought to you by Wikipedia. Um, you'd think they were sponsoring this talk, but they're not. Um, governance is super important and Again, you know, I could, I could write, I think, a blog post or do a talk on, on governance and how like open source governance can really be beneficial to organizations. Um, you see a lot uh, within organizations, right? We talk about, I, I gave the example of uh, EDU, um, happens in larger organizations as well, but they're siloed in some cases, right? The, uh, I'm gonna use EDU again, because I think it's, a, it's pretty relatable, right? But like the School of Technology has their budget for their web website, and the School of um, Architecture has their budget for their website, right? And they're spending money on, on things to, to improve their website. Well, with an omni-channel web platform, you have the ability to pool your resources. You have the ability to do more with that money based on a governance model within your organization that supports it, right? So if we were to take an open source governance model and layer it on top of or below, depending on how you see it, uh, an omni-channel web platform, that becomes super powerful in saving money, 
reducing costs, but not even saving it, using it more effectively to improve the platform well into the future. You have the ability to say, hey, we're gonna take, a, we're gonna take an approach here where similarly to the, the you know, open source model that we all use daily with Drupal, right? If we build a module, right? Everybody can use that module and you can spend you know, your budget to improve that module if you want, but then it benefits everyone that needs it, right? And we're not saying like, I'm not saying that you know, organizations or EDU or whoever adopts this is not going to be able to like build their own features, right? They can do that if they need to. They have a feature that's very specific to them. Like, oh, the architectural school needs a feature to integrate with AutoCAD, right? Okay, well, that's pretty specific to what they do, right? So they build their own feature. They spend their budget to do that, right? That's fine. But where the commonality is, the governance layer needs to support that, it needs to say like, hey, if you're gonna do this, like you're gonna do it in our web platform and we're gonna let everybody benefit from it. Becomes much more of a sustainable ecosystem, I think, going forward. Also, you can look at this as a way to reduce your cost. We were talking about cost savings earlier, reduce your cost of ongoing maintenance, right? Because like we all know, like we're, if we're on Drupal 9, like, hey, there's an upgrade path to Drupal 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and into the future, right? So we don't have to necessarily worry about these big changes from, oh, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 rebuild or from, you know, Adobe to Drupal rebuild. Like, we can now focus on, hey, our content management system has an upgrade path. And we have the ability to now, instead of focusing on upgrades, rebuilds, we can focus on feature improvements to the system, right? That comes from, A, the approach here of, of a omni-channel web platform, but also from a governance model that supports that. Everybody buying into, hey, this is how the system works, and this is why it's going to benefit us, right? All right, so we talked about this, and uh, Listen, it, it was a little late last night, and this one, this one spoke to me. So you can see third-party integrations, right? I think we've all done integrations with the various things on this screen, right? Uh, Drupal helps to support that, right? We have the ability to add modules. We have the ability to, um, you know, to integrate with different systems. Um, Identify those systems before you st set out on your journey to an omni-channel web platform. Think about like, hey, what are those, what's that list of services that everybody in our organization uses? And then what's that list of services that uh, only like a, a small subset of our organization uses? And then maybe we can like, we can cross-link a little bit to say, hey, well, maybe like, you know, this service, we could actually do that with this one so we don't need to bring that one over, right? But now, you, your level setting. Everybody's everybody's using the web platform. Everybody has a uh, access to this set of services, right? That's how we get it. you get adoption. Up. You get people interested in the web platform and the ability to use it, right? So it's definitely something to think about. All right, we're bringing this in for a landing here. As promised, there is a helpful resources link uh, if you um, are so inclined. Uh, it has a video uh, from a headless talk that I did. Um, it was actually a headless webinar that I did with Acquia. Um, it has a, a slide deck from um, uh, another headless uh, talk that I did with uh, at Acquia Engage. And then um, some other videos, some talking Drupal episodes, shameless self-promotion. Also a link to Sam's book if you're interested in picking that up. So as promised, there is plenty of time for Q&A. I thank you for your time. Chris. Uh, an add-on, uh, you were talking about uh, how in a decoupled uh, project, uh, I wrote down the word pragmatic, you need to be pragmatic in your build. Yep. But what follows from that is that with a decoupled site, you're not focused on building templates and components that directly map to things that will appear on the screen. Your build might be different. What you are actually
actually building and what you're actually delivering might be different. And as a result, your team that you need to comprise in order to complete the project might be different. Is that what you have seen? Yeah, so team structure does vary it, with a um, you know headless omnichannel model, right? So like you're looking if you're looking at a couple Drupal site, right, and you're looking at building a team, you're like, hey, we need front end Drupal developers, we need back end Drupal developers, maybe we need some DevOps folks, right? So on and so forth. That changes quite a bit when you get into a headless model because the Drupal theme layer isn't there, right? You're not using that, so you don't need those Drupal front end developers, right? Um, that turns more into React developers, right? Now, you're integrating with third-party systems. So um, at EPAM, we have a whole team that does Salesforce integration, right? So I would say like, hey, if I'm doing a Salesforce integration, I need a Salesforce engineer. So no, now I need like, I need some Drupal engineers to be able to do, to do the Drupal stuff, right? And I need a Salesforce engineer, and you know, maybe I need uh, a commerce tools engineer to come in and help with that integration to make sure that's going well. So yeah, the team structure changes um, quite a bit, I think, from like a standard Drupal website to like this web platform idea. Um, in some cases, it could get bigger. In some cases, it could get smaller if you have internal resources to do the React work, right? You just need those backend resources to develop the APIs to be able to ingest. Um, the other thing that's interesting there in that question is um, the idea of like, you're working on a component-based system, but there could be different delivery methods of your information, right? So for example, if you needed a component that integrated directly to Salesforce for some reason, you know, we talked about Drupal being the glue, but if you had something that like needed to go directly to Salesforce or Stripe, maybe you're taking credit card data, you don't want that to go through Drupal, you want it to go directly to Stripe, right? You want to think about that stuff with the, you know, build of your front end to say, hey, we're doing this product, we're going to have the product card come out of the back end, but for that React component, when the credit card gets processed, it's going right to Stripe. Like, we don't want to deal with that, right? So those are all things that you do want to think about. And uh, yeah, team size is, um, is, a, is a big one. Team composition is a big one because you want to make sure that you have the right resources to be able to build, build the product. Any other questions? Uh, yes, you in the back. So I have, I have two questions. I have two questions. Sure. One of them is you gave me an example of an organization having tens of websites, right? Yep. A headless one. So I would like to know a little bit more on the case study of mm -hmm. that organization. Sure. Second thing is that when I have Drupal, I am making use of a lot of community modules mm -hmm. to build a Drupal website. And then when I build a headless approach, mm -hmm. right? So all those modules which are from community, which have a front end, so they become obsolete. My, so my development increases because I have to, I cannot use them because every one of them are compatible with Drupal theme, but now I've taken a headless approach, which may be React or Angular on the front end, mm -hmm. right? So is there a way, because this increases the development cost a lot and the client is like, mm -hmm. so I see where you're going with that. I'll, I, I will address that, because that's a, that's a great question. Um, let me address the first one, talking about um, the example that I gave where they had multiple websites, multiple units, multiple brands, right? So the way that we're doing it on our project is it's uh, Drupal multi-site behind the scenes. So it's one front end, one set of components, one set of React, a request is made, React says, okay, which, uh, or Next.js, I should say, says, hey, what site is it for? Okay, go back to that Drupal backend and get the data for that site, right? So under the hood, it's a Drupal multi-site. Why is it? Why did the organization wanted such a site? Just trying to understand the business. Uh, understand. Goes back into goes back into the cost savings, right? Because okay. now instead of having silo one, silo two, silo three, silo four, mm -hmm. they now have one platform that all of these brands are using. Mm -hmm. One platform to maintain. One platform to improve. So. We add a feature to the centralized platform. Every site has the ability to use that feature, okay. right? So it's cost savings, reduces their development costs, allows them to put more money into building features as opposed to maintaining a hundred different sites. Okay. Right? Now to get to your second question, there is a shift that you have to make in your brain when you are working with headless Drupal, right? Because you're right. 
if I go and I install the uh, XML sitemap module, right, and I go to my URL slash sitemap.xml, in Drupal, I'm going to get a page that looks like my sitemap. On my headless front end, if I have not thought of that, I'm going to get a 404, right? So the great thing about Drupal is that just because you are not using Drupal's front end doesn't mean that you can't use the module, right? So um, web forms, XML sitemap, there are like a bunch of modules. Almost maybe all, no, that's, a, that's an overstatement, right? Not all modules. But a lot of the very popular modules um, have the ability to connect to the JSON API and have their data sent out via an API. So we're actually finding we're using Drupal modules all day long. XML sitemap, uh, we're not using web forms, but other modules within the ecosystem. And those modules, we're just taking the data and exposing it via an API if it's not already. And, and like we don't need to use the front end. So, you can still use the Drupal module ecosystem, absolutely. Like that's that's good and reduces those development costs you were talking about, right? Because now I don't have to go build my own XML site now. You do have to consider how that shows on the front end, right? Um, but you already have the React developers. And in most cases, I'm assuming the React developer could probably get a page to display that data far quicker than it would take for you to build the whole module from scratch. Um, I think there was another question, yes. Yeah, so you're using Layout Builder, but the front end is detached. So yes. the, the layouts they build, the layouts, and then the blocks, those all pull through through the API? Yes. So what happens is they go into Layout Builder, use it as if you were constructing you know, a, your, uh, you know, any website, if you were using the Drupal front end. And then that all, through the API, gets pushed out. Um, to the React front end, and then um, Next.js and React kind of work through it and say, okay, this is the layout for this page, display the components. So it's converting the layout builder to some kind of generic uh, HTML, CSS, I JavaScript. Do, I do believe, yeah, I do believe, so the way the platform actually is built, because we wanted it to be very customizable, um, it does have a, um, a, an area within the theme where you can set all of the kind of CSS values for colors and fonts and stuff. And that stuff gets put out as a separate CSS file that the front end picks up. But um, I do believe there was a normalizer built to help assist in the, the layout piece of it to make sure that that all went smoothly. Any other questions, Kyle? Is it possible for an IT organization to build this web platform if the business doesn't understand what it is? <laughs> yes, um, because everybody understands that saving money is a good thing. So the hardest problem is probably implementing a governance model. Because what ends up happening is um, you have your silos, right? And anybody that's worked in a large organization knows those silos all have budgets, right? And if you say, hey, there's a way we can save money, we're going to end up reducing your budget. People in those silos that control those budgets get kind of defensive, right? So you want to make sure that when you're approaching this, you're like, listen, <laughs> reduce maintenance costs, reduce budget more spending on better features, more spending on like pushing things forward as opposed to like keeping the status quo, right? But it comes with a change in the governance model. You know, this much of your budget needs to go into building this thing because the, the initial build is not gonna be free, right? So there are ways that you can, you know, you can position it to say like, hey, this is the way to go and here's why. And then, you know, and it also it could be an organizational thing where the organization's like, hey, look, we're just doing this and like everybody else is gonna just kind of fall in line, right? It depends on internal dynamics of the organization. You sell it to Exactly. That they won't get sued for a web accessibility issue. <laughs> well, so that's a great point. It, not so much the lawsuit, but more so the accessibility, right? You have the ability here to test for accessibility more, more widely, more thoroughly, and ensure that hey, this is this is going to be, you know, accessible for for potentially longer and for potentially more people because 
you have that single base. You have the ability to test it, say yes, okay, this is how it's gonna work. And depending on your governance model, you can actually say like, hey, we're governing the fact that you can't use these colors because we're finding like these color patterns inaccessible, right? So you have the ability to kind of be actually in a better place for accessibility and reduce those nasty lawsuits. Any other questions? So uh, I'm just uh, saying what I achieved. Because suddenly from taking three months to build a website for the department takes yep. maybe a week. Yeah, that's another that's another great point, right? So like faster time to market, like is a buzzword. So like, you know, we should have played buzzword bingo with this talk. You guys all would have gotten prizes. But yes, the the ability to move faster is is important. Like marketers are like, oh, I have this idea. We have to move on it. And like typically, you're like, okay, well, it's gonna take three to six months to build the website, and uh, you know, then we gotta test it. And uh, so now you can say, hey, the web platform can have your site up in two months, or as fast as you can get in there and get it provisioned and and you know, add the content, right? So much quicker to get something out the door, which is actually another another big big win, I think. Thank you. Say it is a new thing, a new venture, or a, you know, a new department, new college ads, or whatever. It, uh, how would you approach a minimal viable product? So that, that's a that's a great question. In terms of speed to get something out. So I will say the project that I'm on right now is actually Greenfield Development. It was a brand new project out of the gate, um, and the best way that you can handle that is by doing an MVP and keeping that MVP reasonable. Right? I think we started out with I don't know, 15 or 20 components um, and you know, a very specific set of features. We were like, hey, this is what we're, this is what we're focusing on right? for MVP. We built it, we got it out, we got, we got it working, and then we said, okay, now we're gonna start adding more features. Hey, we need the ability to do this, this will bring another 10 sites on the platform. Oh, if we do this, it'll bring another 20 sites on the platform, right? So, when looking at it that way, you start small and you scale, right? And that actually is, you know, as I was talking about before, like now that Drupal has an upgrade path and is, air quotes, easy to upgrade, right? As long as you're building your modules correctly and thinking about how you're doing things, right? That removes, like that decreases the time of upgrade, the time of maintenance, right? And allows you to get into those features a lot faster, which is what the brands and the schools and the businesses and the units want. They want to be able to say like, oh, I have a feature, right? Let me drop it, let me drop it in there in a queue and like, oh, it's gonna get done in the next month or the next two months, right? Again, going back to that kind of open source uh, way of working. Any other questions, maybe? How do you handle, as you are growing and improving the site, how do you handle uh, backwards compatibility and deprecations over a distributed network of things? So that's a great question. Because the platform I'm working on is very new, we have not necessarily had to um, handle the deprecation aspect of it. Um, but. You know, my, my default answer, and my default answer for a lot of this is planning, communication, and just, just thinking about it. Like, if you know a deprecation is coming, and you're like, okay, if this thing is gonna stop working, what's the plan? What's the path from somebody to get from this doesn't work, this thing not working to whatever the next thing is, right? So it comes down to more planning and working with your dev team to say, okay, like, what, how is this gonna go? Are we gonna incur downtime? Are we going to, um, are we going to be forced to like have people update things because hey we're changing from this to that and you got to go through and do it? Can we automate it? Right. So it comes. It really comes down to planning. I think one of the benefits, especially in being headless, is your ability to um, cash the heck out of your front end. Right. So like you can do a little bit of smoke and mirrors if you have some deprecation that's happening on your back end to say hey we are going to jack up the TTL on the front end, and like that thing is just gonna be cached really well, and then we're gonna go make those changes on our back end, swap the things out, and then like on the front end, like nobody sees any downtime because, you know, because it's cached. So there are ways to handle it. I think you just have to plan for it, kind of take it as a case-by-case -case basis. But in that thinking, like that, that thinking has to happen 
at the onset, right? Because you have to be thinking platform wide. You can't be thinking, oh, this is my site, this is my thing, right? You have to be thinking, you need a team for that. Do you think that's mainly an engineering problem, or do you think governance has to play a larger role in that as well? So I think it's, I think governance is important, very important. Um, I don't know that governance can control like a deprecation, right? So like businesses switch out services all the time. So like that comes from like the business is going to say, hey, we aren't using this service anymore, right? Okay, well we have to switch to this other service. Okay, well we have to build a plan for that. I think there'll be governance around it as far as like, oh, we're switching to this service, you have to do it by this date, right? Have your data in there, whatever it is, right? But I think like, I, I think it's, Honestly, it comes down to being an architectural problem, right? Like, how do we make this as painless for the users as possible? And then working with the engineering team to say, like, what can we do to, like, make this easy? Sure. Right. Any other questions? Barton. You mentioned uh, headless being an advantage for SEO. Can you maybe expand on that? Yeah, so it was um, brought to my attention that, like, some crawlers, I guess, don't like actually render the page when they crawl your website. So like if they go to your site and there's like no rendered thing there, they kind of like ding you for the SEO. So server-side rendering allows for, one, it allows for the site to be built on the servers and then cached in, in whatever your CDN of choice is, right? So then web crawlers are crawling into, into that and it's all rendered. And then they can they can see all of your your great SEO uh, tags and, and juice. So that's kind of where that came in from. Is like, hey, now you have this really fast, which you know, search engines Google likes to likes to tell everybody, hey, your website needs to be fast, right? So it's it, you know you get speed improvements from the server side rendering, but also that now they can read all of your tags and everything on the on the rendered front end. So that was my understanding. So is it really the SSR is better for SEO, or is headless in general better? Well, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I think I think SSR is a good. Um, you know, I would probably say SSR. Like, if you were using, you know, a coupled front end and you could do server side rendering, right? Like, I would I would recommend it. Why not? Like, let the. It, it comes down to like. You know, are you gonna, like? Do you need the user to do that rendering, or can you do it for the user and then provide it to them faster? Right? I mean, it goes back to like the age-old quandary of like, if it takes more than X number of time for your page to load, your user's already gone. Right? So, yeah, I guess it's probably a roundabout way of answering your question is, yeah, I guess it's probably SSR that's uh, that's the benefit, and like headless is just kind of cool. I guess. Any other questions? Out of curiosity, do you use a component library before um, things actually get served, like Storybook or Pattern Lab? So, we are using Storybook. Okay. It is really just a component library repository, right? It is not connected to the platform at all. Mm -hmm. um, that was by design because the client wasn't really sure if Storybook was going to be the way to go. Um, so we wanted to like kind of keep that out, but yeah, basically it's it's a tool, um, almost like a documentation tool, but a, an ability for you know um, sites coming online to see what components are available and to, and to play with them a little bit because you can you can do that stuff. Sorry. So um, when it comes to traditional website development through Drupal, we have a lot of editors, especially WordPress. Like we have a lot of editors. You, as a customer or a graphics person, you can play around with the layout of the page. Mm -hmm. With the headless, it is always like data is coming in the form of JSON or whatever format. So do we have any editors or do, because everything now lies in the hands of the front end person and if there is any change that is needed, the developer or the front end developer has to make a change. So do we have any graphical tools available right now which so, with JSON and they can, uh, a non-tech user can play around with the page builder? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, the platform we're building actually uses Layout Builder, and everything that that page needs to render is fed out through the API. So literally, our developers don't, other than making improvements or fixing bugs, they don't touch the front end code at all. There's a whole content editorial team that goes into the site and uses the, uses Drupal with Layout Builder to be able to position things, style things, um, and do all of that from right from the Drupal backend. 
So like, yeah, they're they're com like completely they're entering content. Like the development team never touches content, never deals with content. Like they're just handling it, and the CMS is putting that stuff all out for the API through the APIs for the front end to consume. So in the layer of builders, uh, we are also doing so. When so JSON contains all the layout components, also of the page. Yep, so basically Layout Builder has the page structure in it, right? So you have like a banner, you have a video, you have component one, component two, right? That all gets sent out via the API. Mm -hmm. And in the API, you know, the React, React and XJS say, okay, well, here's the page that they want. Here's component one, component two, component three. And then, oh, here's the style information coming from the API for that, for that mm -hmm. site. Right, so it's global for the site, but then specifically for the component. Okay, so everything is getting put. Yep. If you need to play with the orders, whether it's a path, it's been like three or four years old, which allows you to expose that information of the order of those blocks. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's really a great way to kind of make this more accessible to content editors and reduce the need for developer intervention. Because that's like, that's like the least, the last thing anybody wants to hear is like, oh, you want to, oh, we're going to have to talk to the development team and have them do that, right? I think they want us out of here. <laughs> oh, let me shut off the recording.